the Bible tells us God is a spirit. God doesn't have a body like yours. If God had a body like yours, he would have to be in one place at one time. But God doesn't have a body like yours. God is a spirit. And God can be in Africa. He can be in Asia. He can be in Europe. He can be in America all at the same time. He can be on a planet. He can be on the moon at the same time. I've talked to some of those astronauts that went to the moon. And they told me that they knew as they went around the moon, there must be a God. I talked to some of the prisoners of war from Vietnam just a few days before I came on this trip. I talked to those first prisoners that came back to the United States and they told us in those prison cells for eight years in Vietnam, they knew there was a God. God is a spirit. The Bible tells us that God is unchanging. He never changes. Fashions change. Every part of our culture and life changes. And vast changes are underway throughout the world. And South Africa is finding that she can no longer live isolated from the rest of the world. Neither can we in America. And the great problems that we face are under tremendous pressure from world public opinion. The jet plane, modern communications have made it impossible. Fashions change, culture changes, technology changes, but God never changes. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says there is no variableness, nor shadow of turning with God. God has not changed in thousands of years. 10,000 times 10,000 years from now, God will be the same. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God does not change. The Bible also tells us that God is a holy God. Absolutely holy. The Bible says thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Thou canst not look on iniquity. God is holy and righteous. And you'll never understand God. You'll never understand about God and God's dealing with us until you understand that God is absolutely pure and God is absolutely holy and God cannot even look upon sin with any approval whatsoever. And then the Bible tells us that God is a God of judgment. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, the Bible says, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's a judgment day coming. You're going to be there if you're outside of Christ. And every secret thing will be brought to light. Everything that you hid, everything that you did that you didn't think anybody knew about, all of your thoughts, all of your motives, all of your intents, all of your actions are on God's computers. And God is keeping a record. And someday you're going to have to stand before a holy God and give an account at the great judgment day. Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. The Apostle Paul said in his great sermon at Athens, he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man Christ Jesus. There's a day of judgment coming. He has appointed a day. It's all set. You're going to be there. And every secret thing that you've ever thought or done will be flashed on the scoreboards up in heaven at the judgment. And the whole world will see what you really were down inside. God is a God of judgment. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of love. That God loves. I'm glad that's in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And that God loves everybody. I don't care who you are. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He's interested in you. And he loves you. Now, there are several Greek words that are translated love. Eros means sensual love, sexual love. Phileo means friendship love, the love that I would have for a friend. But when the writers of the New Testament were trying to find a word that would describe the love of God, they invented a new word, agape, the divine love, a love that we cannot know outside of God. There is no love 
that you can think of in human relationships comparable to the love that God has for you and that God has for me. God loves you. You say, but Billy, I don't deserve such love. I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. I failed him a thousand times. I know. That's the beauty and the greatness and the thrill of God's love. That no matter what you've done, he loves you. For God so loved the world, the black world, the white world, the yellow world, the red world, the rich world, the poor world, the uneducated world, the educated world. And he loves us all the same. God loves you. And God loved us so much that he gave his son. Now, why did he have to give his son? What happened? What tragedy? What disaster came upon the human race? The Bible tells us that God created you, created man. He put him in paradise. He put him in utopia. And God gave to man a gift he did not give to his other creatures. God created us in his image. Not in the physical image of God, but in the spiritual image. We have a moral nature, and we have the right to choose. And God said, I'm going to give you everything in the world for your happiness. But there's one tree over here that I don't want you to touch. Because I've given you the freedom of choice. I want you to choose me because you want to. I want you to love me and serve me because you want to serve me. You want to love me. I don't want you to do it because I make you. I've given you the tremendous responsibility of freedom of choice. So I put a tree here. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt die. What happened? Man looked at the tree. He looked at the fruit. He saw it was an unusual fruit. Probably had a magnificent taste. The devil was then the form of a serpent to tempt him. And the Bible says that man broke the law of God. Man rebelled against God. Man failed the test. And man made his own deliberate choice. God said in the day that you eat it, in the day that you rebel against me, in the day that you break this law of the Garden of Eden, you shall die. God had to keep his word. Man had to die. Or God would not be holy. So from that moment on, man began to die. He died physically. He died spiritually. He died eternally. And all the troubles and all the problems of the world down through history have come from that great disaster because all of us are the sons of Adam. All of our prejudices, all of our hates, all of our fightings, all of our bickerings, all of our jealousies, all of our pride, everything that troubles the human race today came from the fact that we have rebelled against God and we're all guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. You have sinned. I have sinned. We are guilty. Pascal once said, in seeking to become angels, we have become less than men. Carl Jung, the great psychologist, once said, it is becoming more and more obvious that our problems are not social. He said it's not starvation, it's not cancer, but man himself who is mankind's greatest danger. Bertrand Russell once said, it is in our hearts that the evil lies. It's in our hearts. That's what Jesus taught, that our problems lie in our hearts because Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. Jesus said, your problem is a heart problem. The Apostle Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's a mystery about it. None of us really knows exactly where the devil came from. I'm writing a book right now on the devil. 
I've been doing a lot of research for 18 months on the subject. We don't know for sure exactly how the devil came, but we know that he's a factor. We know that he is there, tempting and pulling and trying us and attacking us and harassing us at every turn. And we know that mankind made the fateful choice in Adam to follow the devil instead of God. But the Bible says in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sins, God loves us. And God gave his only son. Now the Bible says the wages of sin, the result of sin is death. What kind of death? Well, you go out here and you see the cemeteries and you know that people die physically. Yes, we're all going to die. In a hundred years, every person in this will always be dead. Perhaps in 50 years, we'll all be dead. Everybody will be dead. I'm 54 years of age. The most of my life has already been lived. I know that I'm going to die unless Christ comes first. I know that I'm going to die. It's appointed unto man wants to die. That's a result of sin that has infected the whole human race. Then there's spiritual death. What is spiritual death? Well, spiritual death is where you are alive in a sense, but you're also dead. And that's why you find movie stars who reach the top. The sex symbols like Marilyn Monroe. Many of them commit suicide. Many of them are unhappy. Why? Because they thought that if they had power and fame and money, they'd be happy. But they're not happy. Why? Because spiritually, your soul, made in the image of God, is separated from God, and your soul keeps crying out for God. And you say, well, if I make a little more money, maybe my soul will be happy. Or if I get a little more power, or if I have a little more influence, I'll be happy. But the trouble is, you're not happy. You see, you want more. And you don't get that certain something that you're always looking for. It's always elusive. It's always out there in the future somewhere. Why? Because your soul is searching for God. And your soul made in the image of God says, I want God. And St. Augustine said, it's restless till it finds God. And until you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive him into your heart, you'll always be questing and looking and trying to find, but you won't be able to find. Then there's a third death, and that's called eternal death. That's what Jesus called hell. He used the word lost, perish, condemn, hell, punishment, whatever it is. It is separation from God because of our sins. And the Bible indicates that Jesus believed that there was future world, there was a future heaven, and a future hell. Now in the midst of all that, God says, I love man so much, I want to save him. So what did God do? God devised a magnificent plan to redeem you, to save you. He decided to come to earth and to become a man. And that's who Jesus Christ was.